Fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome everyone to this uh, TIA Centre seminar. Um, so this will be our penultimate seminar of the academic year. And we're delighted to be joined in person by uh, Dr. Mardi Sani. And he's from Concordia University in Montreal. Now, um, Dr. Mardi is an assistant professor of computer science in the Department of Computer Science and Software Engineering at Concordia University. And is a faculty member of the Applied AI Institute at Concordia. He received his PhD from the Edward S. Rogers um, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto, 2016, from the Multimedia Lab under the supervision of Professor Konstantinos uh, Platiantis. Excuse me. He continued as a postdoc research fellow at the at University of Toronto in collaboration with Huron Digital Pathology at Waterloo, at Waterloo Ontario. During his postdoctoral study at the um, University of Toronto, he received two fellowships of the Mitax Elevate Award and the NSERC Research Funding. Dr. Zeni continues his collaboration with Huron Digital Pathology in the capacity of Senior Research Scientist for Transformational Changes of Digital Pathology Solutions in Clinical Healthcare Systems. His research is primarily in advancing the foundational developments of deep learning and computer vision algorithms, which are efficiently designed for computational pathology applications. He is currently supervising several graduate students on related topics, and his vision is to develop, in collaboration with hospitals and pathologists, meaningful computer-aided diagnosis systems as assistive tools in clinical pathology for cancer diagnosis and treatment. He has published more than 30 papers and two patent applications in related fields. Um, Dr. Sunny's reviewing services cover well-known revenues in CVF Foundation and ML conferences. And Dr. Sunny is a select area chair for CVPR 2024, 2023, and 2023, and also in Europe's 2023. Uh, thank you very much, and I will pass you over to, uh, to Dr. Mardi. Thank you so much, Adam. If I knew that you were going to read the whole thing, I would make it way shorter. <laughs> Brilliant. Can we just confirm that everyone online can hear uh, Dr. Mardi? Okay. Do you want to say something? We can, uh... Sure. Yeah. You want me to come to that station? Like, how do you? Yeah, I mean, you, you can just if you like. I can move over if you like. It, uh, it's yeah, just one. It's fine. I can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Want to present? I was saying. Uh, just take the video. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, maybe I can just sit and just can see this. Okay. Hi, everyone. Yes. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here uh, with, uh, with the experts in the TIA. Um, so uh, without further ado, like I'll just basically transition to my slides. Like uh, you, you know who I am now. <laughs> with that long by sorry for that though. Um, so the, uh, the outline, uh, the topic of my presentation is computational pathology. And I'm gonna go through the current trend and then the future challenges, as well as you know my, uh, my own research topics from Atlas Analytics Lab at Concordia. So I'll, I'll briefly introduce the, uh, the co-path. I'll just skim it through because I know that most of you guys are uh, well familiar with this topic. And then uh, I'll dig into this co path from three different perspectives, application-centric, data-centric, and model-centric. And then hopefully I'll introduce a few of the works from my own lab as well. Okay, so uh, just a very brief overview from the computational pathology. God forbid somebody has a cancer, right? Uh, and we want to collaborate with a pathologist to develop a co path application. So the way it works is, uh, you know, the, the patient gets referred to the hospital, perhaps by the radiologist, uh, because they want to dig into more the, the detailed analysis of the tissue. Uh, the tissue gets prepared in the pathology lab, and then uh, the tissue becomes available on the glasses slides. And in the glasses slides with the optical microscopy, that's how the pathologists they study the uh, uh, the micro uh, the tissues. This has been the convention, as you know, for more than 150 years, actually. So digital pathology uh, is the digitized version of the optical microscopy, as we may say. 
And uh, the way it works is that, you know, you feed in like, uh, you know, uh, tons of slides, like you no know, tens to uh, hundreds nowadays, hundreds to thousands of the slides, the whole slide image scanner. And then you have the, you know, uh, uh, abundance of these whole slide images. And because of the digital image acquisition systems, you will face with, uh, you know, several uh, issues. One of the uh, most one is the outbox issue, which needs to be, you know, quality check before, you know, passing it to the digital department. So pathologists are sitting in their office, or perhaps the digital pathology has been integrated in their office. They have access to the uh, digital yeah, images as well as, you know, the LIS to fill in the, the report, right? And then they do have the, uh, you know, the leverage of contacting their colleagues, assuming they do have also access to the digital pathology platform, IMS, and then they can communicate, and then like, you know, share the uh, information and then they can sign out the cases. Um, well, uh, as you know, whole slide images are gigapixel images. They built in pyramid format. Uh, depending on the tissue type, if it's, let's say, if it's uh, you know, breast or like from coming from cervix, there's gonna be a big chunk of tissues, uh, usually sometimes like a two to three centimeter of tissues. And if you collect around a quarter of micron per pixel, you will end up with like you no know, gigantic image, uh, which is a gigapixel for sure. So equivalent cognitive workload for the pathologist is that you know you can actually consider somebody's walking through the football field and is studying the grass, every grass one by one to make sure that everything's okay. So that's how the equivalent cognition could probably compare. Um, so, and if the, uh, the clinical pathology of the clinical department, uh, clinical pathology department is integrated with the digital pathology, but uh, there will be a flow of like, you know, sometimes hundreds to thousands of slides. And assuming that every slide will consume several gigabytes in compressed format, then we, will, we are collecting more than terabytes of data per day. And that's how the, uh, you know, the realistic nature of the digital pathology department is. Like you will end up collecting petabytes of data per year and uh, probably good luck with that <laughs> to store them. And you, you need to perhaps flush it out because of the limited capacity that you will face. Uh, so the question would be really is that, do we really want to stick with digital pathology? Obviously not because uh, once you have the digital data, that's how, where we show up as a computer scientist. Um, the, I would say the, uh, the standard approach uh, up to now for the past few years is that we collaborate with the pathologist, with the expert, to get some meaningful annotations or supervision from the data. And then using those expert knowledges, then we develop our machine learning model with, which fits that representation. And once you actually develop those models, then you associate or utilize them, adopt them in certain application, to come up with different tasks that you had in mind perhaps right in the beginning, because the annotations needs to be fitted with the, uh, with the application of your mind. And then like, you know, what you're delivering is going to be like, you know, representing that data, right? Uh, in an application format, like you know, it was a CAD system. So assuming that we have a CAD software, then the pathologist needs to actually uh, also help us to valid validate them. When I say we, it means like as a community, okay? Sorry for that. Um, and then uh, uh, based on the feedbacks, you know, uh, we, we collect, uh, maybe we need more data. Maybe we need actually ask the digital department to tune some of the digitization aspects of the images, or maybe we need to collect more expert knowledge. Uh, as a computer science, maybe you need to actually revise the model that you're, uh, uh, you know, using as a representation learning model, perhaps, or the application is not really uh, expressing, uh, it's not interacting well with the UI interface with the pathologist as a CAD software, so you need to actually revise. So, well, the vision perhaps is that, you know, we need to go revolve around until we reach to a stable solution, perhaps, as a CAD software. Okay, so uh, I'm going to dig into the survey uh, review that we had done recently. This has been the project for more than uh, two years now, which I started back at UFD when I was doing my postdoc. Uh, so at that time, we were facing actually limited published works in uh, you know, survey like you know, reviews in the field. And uh, 
uh, because of the diverse works in the field, we were really wondering like how this, how the landscape really looks like when it comes to computational pathology. So what we did uh, with help of actually many students, uh, uh, we collected uh, the pathology, com computational pathology related papers, keywords coming from deep learning, perhaps the AI and with the uh, application side of the pathology. And, uh, and then um, uh, up to now, what we have submitted, which was a few months ago, uh, we have cited more than 700 papers in related fields. It covers different organ application sites, uh, how the data is collected in the community, uh, how the expert knowledge is collected, uh, how the representational learning models are developed, and what are the terms of evaluations and regulations. And also, we uh, also discussed the existing challenges and future opportunities. So a uh, part of my presentation will be covering uh, some part of this survey paper. One of the uh, interesting aspects of this paper is uh, we have introduced a model card for computational pathology, similar work that, similar proposal that Google and U of T that uh, proposed back in the 2018, that if you're actually doing a, uh, any project related to the AI, uh, tell us like in a one model card that what is the data that you're using in what application field and what are the model you're, uh, you're using and also associate hyperparameters as such. Well, when it comes to computational pathology, because it's cross-disciplinary, well, it will have more, uh, you know, aspects of the, uh, you know, the cross field as well. So we adopt accordingly and like provide a model card for every paper that's 700 papers. So we will also release that, you know, archive soon as well. Um, okay. so. And uh, so this paper mainly uh, views the co-path from three different fields, data-centric, which is also well-known in AI, model-centric. And the third pillar is really the clinical applications. And actually that comes first because we need to understand how the clinic works in pathology and how it actually translates into data science. So uh, more or less, if you look into the clinical pathology workflow, we have three phases, pre-analytical, analytical phase, and post-analytical. So pre-analytical are the phases that, you know, the tissue gets sent to the pathology lab and it gets prepared until the digitization. So any steps uh, uh, involved in preparation, fixation, you know, uh, all those, you know, aspects in the clinicals, clinics, all the way to the dig digitization, image quality assessment, are the pre-analytical until you deliver that digital pathology images to the pathologist. Um, the analytical phase is the part that the pathologist you know, study the, uh, the, micro, the tissues under the microscopy, and then they come up with the diagnostics uh, of their mind, right, uh, of their opinion, after doing like, you know, uh, perhaps uh, vetted by their colleagues as a second or the third opinion. And then uh, also there's a post-analytical, which they need to actually fill in the LIS report, so which is the synoptic report, which is the standard diagnosis nowadays. Uh, and that also has its own barriers. So in every aspect, the AI has the potential where the computational pathology can be developed. Um, if you're interested in the, uh, the topics, I would suggest to take a look at the, uh, the paper. Um, so if we want to put that into perspective, really is that we have the uh, digital pathology. Sorry, let me actually uh, activate my laser point. So um, we have the, uh, you know, the patient uh, getting referred to the pathology, the tissue gets prepared. And then assuming that we have the digital pathology platform, there will be an image management system, the IMS. And then that's how it, you know, communicates with the pathologist. And then assuming that we have a CAT software, hopefully it will be integrated to the IMS. Uh, and then you have the CAT, which interacts with the IMS and also pathologists with that digital platform. And then they sign out cases. Um, and then these are the potential applications of three different phases that we just covered. If it's pre-analytical, you have uh, several you know, potentials that you can collaborate with the clin clinical pathology. Analytical phase are mainly at the diagnostic phases, which, uh, which you would, find uh, abundance of these uh, computational pathology papers related to diagnostics. And then also the post-analytical, which is the, you know, uh, helping the pathologist perhaps to populate the synoptic reports. Um, so let's dig into every one of these aspects uh, one by one. 
So when it comes to, like, uh, to diagnostics, like as you know, we're referring as being the tissue, de like the detection of points of interest, like perhaps mitotic figures, tissue subtype classifications, diagnosing disease classes, uh, as well as segmenting areas for better visual navigation for the patho pathologist, perhaps. Uh, the prognosis is that, you know, what is the predicting, basically predicting the likely development of the disease based on a given patient's feature. It mainly uses like you know, the whole slide images, just the pathology slides, all, as well as, you know, the survival data from the patients. So that's the, the prognosis. And then- Did you use like a Cochrane type of methodology for systematic literature review or was it just Google Scholar and PubMed? And oh, no, so like, what was the first one? The, the Cochrane, it, it's a very common meta-analysis methodology for Systematic literature review that's used in medicine quite a lot. I see. Uh, we we considered actually several platforms: Google Scholar, PubMed, Scopus, okay. to make sure that we're not missing. Mm -hmm. Also, the citations as well of those mm -hmm. seminal works, um, but not the one that we're mm -hmm. actually. I'm not. So, so, with, yeah. so the way it works is it has very elaborate kind of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Then you have a consort diagram. I mean, a lot of uh, technical review papers don't do that, in, but in the in the medicine field, um, it is common practice to do meta analysis using that systematic way of. Uh, what was the keyword? Uh, C O C H R A N E Cochrane. Cochrane. Yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's a, it's a great review, and like I said, a lot of technical reviews don't use a very systematic way of doing literature review like like they do in medicine. Um, and, um, and also the last one is the prediction of the treatment response. Well, um, the identify, like, no, not every patient corresponds to the same chemotherapy uh, similarly. So the question would be that, what are the predictive markers that seen as a positive treatment responses? So basically becomes a personalized medicine, a targeted therapy. So that's the, the terminology, how it is defined. Um, so a bit of a backup. Like, you know, uh, one of the authors of our, of our papers is coming from a medical doctorate degree, and he has actually done a good survey in the field. Um, well, the, cancer is the first major cause of the death worldwide, as reported in 2020. Uh, it's from every six deaths, one of them is related to the cancer. Uh, four most common cancers are breast, prostate, colon, rectum, and lung. And... Uh, uh, and, and, and basically, uh, what are you seeing as the figure on the right side are the, uh, every circle relates to different organ diseases. And uh, the breakdown in the pie chart are the different types of cancers per organ. And, uh, and then the highlighted color is the severity of the disease, which relates to the survivability of that, uh, the related survivability. And uh, the percentage is the popularity of that cancer. So. Um, as you can see, the, the most commons are, as we just mentioned, and uh, lung is basically one of those deadly ones because it's uh, common as well as, you know, the survival, like the severity is high. So it means that they have a poor prognos prognostic, uh, prognosis. Um, so the major setback in clinical pathology, that's how it's perceived by the pathologists, is that the number of the uh, pathology cases are increasing. Uh, as well as, you know, the board certified pathologist, at least in the US, uh, it's being reported that it's going to shrink down from uh, uh, 18,000 to 14,000 by the end of 2020s. So that's, a, that's an alarming, basically, uh, factor. So we need that take to take that to account. Um, and, uh, well, uh, if you just basically, let's say that, uh, how the flow path could be envisioned in, in, in the clinical pathology, you can expedite the workflow. For instance, if you're dealing with breast cancer and because it's very common uh, and there's the prognosis is actually is high. So like this has a good prognosis. Then uh, you, if you're developing a tool that it perhaps it can expedite the workflow. So it increase, de decreases the workload for the pathologist. Or if you're actually dealing with lung cancer, the AI can actually help to increase the prognosis. So that depends on the uh, organ and the disease. Um, 
Okay, so let's actually start with the domain expertise in the like no the annotation piece. We're talking about the annotation. What kind of annotations do we have when it comes to computational topology data? Well, uh, the first step in developing a co-path, uh, uh, you know, utility is to collect uh, representative data. So the keyword is the representative representation, the representing of what perhaps the organ and the disease, right? Uh, there are key factors that we need to take into account. Uh, which causes the out of this uh, out of distribution problems. So artifacts and irregularities are the, uh, the main cause. Uh, we're referring to like you no know, tissue tears, folds, uh, you know, all those irregular like the artifact that it's related to the uh, up until the digi digitization, right? Um, we have the variations in stain color because if you move from one laboratory to another, although the protocols are standard in uh, curriculum of pathology, but with a bit of a minor, like, you know, differences from one step to another, you will end up with different stain, uh, you know, color. Uh, so it means that the same tissue can, can be represented differently in terms of color distribution from one lab to another. Uh, variations, the whole slide image scanners, like there's no uh, common standard across the vendors of the uh, digital pathology vendors. So that means that one company to another, they will also end up giving you a different uh, representation of the digital slides. Uh, and then the storage and the standardization also is the, the factor for, uh, for sure that you need to take account because that's a like, you know, gigapixel images. And there are also defects like in the whole slide images. Uh, the outmost one is the out of focus, uh, which you're going to deal with because of the you know, the, uh, the, the difference between the focus level of the objective lens and the tissue in the uh, digital pathology scanner that, which is uh, known as the, uh, the, one of the greatest factors for false positives when it comes to uh, co-path you know, uh, tools. Um, so <clears throat> if you are like, if, if we are going to collect, let's say, you know, uh, the data set, the question is that, do we have to include large quantity with degree of variation? Look, in what degree of variations and artifacts for developing our AI for deep learning, right? <laughs> should we include like a lot of variations and irregularities or are we not, you shouldn't. So that's the dilemma that you're going to face with if you're actually in the business of creating, compiling your data, right? Um, do we have to include simple cases as well as difficult cases, pathology cases? somehow close to the curriculum training. That's how the residences go through. Uh, how are you going to control that? That's the, one of the main questions that I perhaps we need to ask while we're going to compile the data. Um, what is the uh, basically the quality of the ground truth annotations? Like, you know, how are you going to control that while you're asking the experts to engage with the data to collect that uh, you know, ground truth? Uh, all right, the data that you're using, like that we're collecting, perhaps you have a task in mind, right? That's, that's how we collect the data. The question is that other than the tax that in your mind, how reusable would that data would be for the other labs and other applications? So that's another perhaps the factor that we need to consider. What is the balance, like the class balance? When, when you're ask, asking the experts how balanced you are going to, uh, your, your, your annotations would be balanced out. And uh, if you actually look into the, you know, the existing data sets, uh, the existing data are really small scale. Now, either they have the small uh, number of images per class, like no limited number of class, or the pathology, like the small number of pathology laboratories are involved to create that data set. So this is one of the like you know, examples of the tables from the appendix of our paper that you know we identified majority of the data sets in the field up until 2022, and uh, you know you have the links whether they are available or not available, what diet, what kind of staining type they. They are concentrating on, well, uh, mostly h &E because it consumes more than 90% of our staining protocol in clinical pathology. What is the organ that you're, it's dealing with? We break down by organ by organ. And then what is the size of the data? Is it the patients and it's a patient level? Like, you no, know, uh, what is the number of the patients or whole slide images? Is it annotated on the, you know, is it provided in the ROI or like you no know, whole slide images or patches? Uh, the resolution annotation level and, uh, you know, the labels, is it, uh, you know, is the classes, the number of the classes and the class balance. So it is mainly like, you know, how it is like revolved around. Right? 
So when it comes to the level of yes. General comment on this slide. I suppose the, the first two questions are not a dilemma to me, to be honest. I mean, there are many researchers that have investigated this and actually suggest that. So it's obvious that as much as variation you can include in the data set, it makes it like a real life situation, yes. meaning that you have artifacts and things like it. It's going to be a better data set and you're training the learning models on it, obviously. We're going to generalize better to understand data. data. So I suppose it's not a dilemma anymore. Just have as much as variation you can in the data set. Okay. You always perform better. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 like, it's like, you know, when you ask from one, like, you know, you do like the, the uh, ask from one researcher to another it's definitely it's like you know i would say that probably the majority would say that you need to include all those irregularities but you know like as a computer scientist i always kind of like has been hesitant nowadays mm -hmm. i don't want to generalize things <laughs> like at least maybe we should create uh, some open questions that if that's the case then how can we actually prove that that would be the case mm -hmm. Because I'm going to come with the, the data, like you know, the work that we are doing with the, you know, our data set, which we call the Atlas of Digital Technology. You can actually dig into that from a different perspective. Like, you know, uh, not in terms of irregularities, but like you know, the notion would be different. Like I'll, I'll get into that. In here. But yes, you're, you're, you're right. Like, you know, the more inclusion of the diversity, so the less, uh, the less basically uh, dependent going to be on the out of distribution problem. And, and that's right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what is the level of the annotations? Uh, well, we have the patient case, like the cases, the patients, right? Every patient comes with like, you no, know, from one slide to probably like, you no, know, 10, uh, 10 slides or even probably more, depending on how much frequently has been asked by the pathologist to collect more samples. Uh, so, and, and also like the slides also, like when you are giving with the slide, the primary site is, Mostly is like no known, right? Um, unless you do a biopsy and, and, and it is actually in, uh, it is somehow, it is kind of fuzzy in between like no the organs and you might really want to just want to make sure that where the primary site is coming from, but more or less like you know where the primary site is coming from. So uh, when you're giving with these slides by the, uh, you know, the pathology, clinical pathology, uh, you would know that where that, you know, uh, the slide information is coming, like what it is, what organ and perhaps what diseases are inside the, the slide. Uh, if you want to engage more of the time of the pathologist, you're asking them to annotate for you on the region of interest level, mainly with the polygon shapes, right? And then uh, maybe if you want to uh, go more granular, you want to extract patches, right? And if you want to go like you no know, deeper, you need to ask them to do a pixel level annotation. And all of them are dependent on what kind of task you're developing. If you're mainly looking for the segmentation, perhaps you need more granular data and, and so on, right? Um, so if we look into the, you know, the level of the annotations uh, across the, you know, the field and depending on the tasks, as you can see that when it comes to segmentation, uh, majority of them, they need the pixel level. Uh, for classification, region of interest would be also uh, would be sufficing. And also on the slide level, um, uh, also classification can work, right? Um, so we're gonna go through those you know, methodologies, the MIL and so on, which can easily work on the slide level. Um, so one of the, if you so we just wanna put that you know, long table that we have in the appendix in like one bigger picture is that how the distribution of the data looks like. Uh, the highlight, uh, the transparent color corresponds for the data set, they're not publicly available. Uh, the darker ones are the ones that they are publicly available or they are available by request. So you need to go either to throw some registration or like, no, you need to request. Um, is the Y axis the number of data sets or the volume? Pardon? The Y axis the number of data sets or the volume? Yes, the Y axis the number of data sets. Okay. And the x-axis uh, corresponds to the different yeah. organs. And there are some organs, right, such as the you know, pancreas, that you wouldn't find available, publicly available data. 
And pancreas, by the way, is one of the most severe cancers. So like deadly cancers, it's known as like the deadly cancer. So that, that's the, you know, the, really the landscapes really is gonna look like. There are a few prominent data sets such as chameleon data sets. They're publicly available, statistically significant, uh, you know, and they're also like you know, released by the ground challenges. Uh, most prominent one, as we may know, like is the TCGA, right? Which has more than right now 30,000 whole slides of images publicly available. Um, and it's being used in large number of works nowadays, uh, containing many organs and diseases. And it's been showing that, you know, the because this is one of the uh, huge concerns for the pathologist that uh, how are we going to deal with the patient's privacy? It shows that you can actually scale without, the, like, you know, without uh, you know, leaking uh, the patient's you know, privacy, like the data. And uh, what what is interestingly what is happening that so there are actually many works you would find that they take the TCGA because they provide the data on the weak uh, supervision form. It's like mainly available on the slide level what kind of diagnosis diagnosis it has, and then they start annotating. Uh, more granular. So into a better perspective, this is how really. Uh, so what was the chart in the bottom part of your This one? Yeah. So this one here, it shows, you know, the different organs. Uh, the one here, it shows you um, uh, there are like um, uh, how many of them are available in H&E, like, and then the other stains. And then also in what level of annotations they are being provided. Yeah. The figures are not probably that great. Yeah, that great. Oh. Yeah, it's a small area, yeah. yes. Okay, we could. Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, yeah. So this is the like no, this is my own, like the way that I'm interpreting, like, no, it's not really a a thing like it's being stated, like the way really, if you look at it, the TCGA, right? It's providing the base flat platform for the weekly or self-supervised data on the slide level and patient level. And then you would find uh, bits and pieces that people are like you know, annotating these data sets with the ROIs for different diseases and organs, right? And even you would find some data set they annotate on a patch level or even probably pixel level, right? Uh, hopefully down the road, uh, more people would involve and annotate in different levels, right? And the question is that, can we really harness a unified data set, uh, you know, to scale with different levels of annotations for representation learning, right? Um, that's the, the multitasking or like multimodal representation in terms of annotation is that question is that how can I leverage different levels of annotations for better representation learning in AI? So one one way of going about that, if, if, if the goal is better representation learning, and you've mentioned self-supervised as well, you don't need any labels whatsoever, but just do it at different scales, right? Wouldn't that be one way of coming up with multi-scale representations? Yes. Um, you know, you don't need any labels for it. Why do you need any education? Right. Um, uh, if you go purely unsupervised, uh, then you're going to deal with, with abundance of data, which is no problem now. But, but perhaps when at the end of the day, you want a downstream, right? Mm -hmm. And if, we, if you know the downstream, like, you know, the annotations that you're looking for, maybe you can incorporate those labels earlier than later to for, for representation. But you don't, have, you don't have those labels for all of the data exactly. that you can use for self-supervised based pre-training. Yes. And, and representation learning. Right? Yes, yes. So yes. Why, why not do that step first, the self-supervised uh, representation learning or pre-training first, and then take whatever data you've got. That's right. and, and, um, That's the that, common right? practice. That's the common practice. Now it's like, you know, it's more mainly populating. The mm -hmm. first stage is to representation learning. It's not that common, as far as I know, in the, in the computational quality space yet. But that's, that's, that's where it should be going. Yeah, taking a toll. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that, should be, that should be the way going forward. Okay, cool. thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I, I'm going to move away from the data set now. I'm going to go to the representation learning part. Uh, just uh, uh, going to skim this uh, a bit fast. So, 
uh, the question is that which representational learning model we are really going to use, right? Um, the, the first part is that you need to identify your problem, right? Uh, the, the domain of the organ and disease should be given. And then, uh, you know, define the corresponding data sets. Are you going to uh, collect your own or like you're going to use pre-existing data set? Uh, and then based on that data set, the question is that how are you going to design your representation learning model or the algorithm? Um, so when it, what, is meaning, uh, what, what, what is the meaning of this in, of the representation learning model in Copath is that you need the set of algorithm techniques to learn feature representation from certain data domain, right? Uh, and then perhaps it can be used for downstream tasks or classification. So you need to learn the representation features, embedded space, and then downstream. Uh, that's the probably go back goes back to your point. Um, and then the key the, the key points uh, to to basically to design our models that uh, what is the scale of the data that is available for learning, and what is the given annotation level, right? And then the the task definition the, in relation to the task definition that you're going to build this model. So they are interrelated. Um, so definition of class, like the classification architecture, you have an encoder, right? And you uh, mostly what has been done in the past is that you have, uh, you know, the, uh, the it's basically the tissue subtype classification, and you want to diagnose, like you know, detect or diagnose the uh, class diseases. And then the conventional, like most the classic, the classification models are mainly populated by the CNNs as well as the vision transformer nowadays. And uh, the general consideration is that, you know, the pre-trained weights could be transferred from computer vision domains such as ImageNet, right? And, and then it could be followed by fine tuning or deep tuning of your model. Uh, and then if you want to go with a better representation to uh, consider the, you know, the interrelationships of different points in your slide, uh, you know, uh, also you can think of it as a graph, uh, graph neural network, like a process that patches are considered as nodes. Connection between patches are the, you know, uh, connections between the nodes, the graphs, and then uh, you know it's learning model by the graph convolutional neural network. That's the definition of the classification architecture. Um, segmentation well involves with encoder and decoder, as you know. Uh, and to do that, you need the pixel level annotation to develop the basic the, the, uh, the decoder model. Nowadays, mainly the UNET. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, for the encoder, you need to contract the features spatially. That's the, you know, what is the, uh, that, that's how it's really done, right? So you have the raw pixels by encoder, we are contracting the features spatially. And then by the decoder, we are expanding them again to capture the semantically related context and generate pixel level prediction. Um, okay, so object detection again. So it involves with like, you know, the, you want to uh, identify points of interest, region of interest on the slide, right? Uh, and then uh, you need some sort of embedding, like you no know, feature extraction, and then with like you no know, uh, uh, with with, and then the output is the points and the bounding boxes, number of instances for features of interest. That's how it is defined. And then you need to aggregate those features, perhaps to uh, relate with those points of, of interest. Uh, multitask learning is that you know the uh, the question is that can I if I want to develop classification, for example classification and segmentation at the same time. Uh, well, do I need to do these in parallel or like I can embed them together as all in one model, right? Well, if you look into the segmentation model, it has the encoder parts, right? So perhaps the embedded features could be fuselage to for the classific classification and the decoder parts of the segmentation. But the downside is that you need both pixel levels as well as the class labels. So it requires like there are ups and downs. Uh, the benefit is that it generates more generalized representation and also avoids training multiple deep learning models for different tasks. Um, so one of the things that it's underestimated or like no, it's not really answered properly in our field is that what are the really the architectures, the encoder architectures we're going to use? Like majority of these methods are like the majority of these architectures are, are adopted from the off-the-shelf solutions. And few of the works we have been observing that they are using, like they're basically custom tailoring these architectures to fit the data. So that's also something perhaps we need to take into account 
that while we are developing our you know encoder models. So any so in this figure the unit do you mean like the original unit or any unit of yeah. architecture? So, so, uh, sometimes with more or less like you no know, adjustments to right. revisit the architecture to fit to the, the data. But it, architecture comes with hyperparameters, right? Mm -hmm. So like, the question is that those architectures perhaps are developed for the purpose of representing computer vision, don't they? Then? They're not necessarily optimized for our data set. Right? Mm -hmm. So the question is that, are they really the optimized model for our domain? So, yeah. That's a really difficult question to answer because what is an optimal model? I mean, ideally you should go through the, the cert the, the whole space of all possible architectures mm -hmm. before you can say yeah. which model is is optimal for for a yeah, given task right there's no way of finding an optimal model so it's not my view is more than like there's no image net equivalent in see because every time there's new because every new architecture comes out every year it's slightly better on image net because cpath doesn't have one of those you kind of just play around the dark a lot trying to kind of figure it out i mean there's not but maybe you just take the off-the-shelf one because they work in natural images where there's more variation. So the efficient they work very well in sleep that is correct in my view. So I think that's part of it as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Yes. That's, that's, it starts with the data. Um, definition of the optimality, at least from my viewpoint, is um, like the vision, like is really the question is what are we developing? Are we developing something that's going to get used? Hopefully in future, right? And that translates to edge devices, perhaps, in their utility, or maybe they have a centralized server, like depends on their, you know, infrastructural, like, you know, position. And then accordingly, do you need to develop a model to efficiently process these data because these are gigapixel images. So you could have to go through patches, and then like, you no, know, as long as you can maintain the accuracy and then like, you no, know, optimize or shrink down the model. Put together computational tools, then that could be one way of looking at it. Yeah, that's a good question here. If you're interested, Tom, we've only got about five minutes left. Anyway, right. so unless everyone's free to carry on past half past 12, we've got a room to one. I'll ask them later on. Yeah, okay, we've got lunch booked. Um, is it Scarman? Yeah. Lunch booked of Scarman for four, um, and then starts at half 12. Okay. So maybe um, just 15 minutes okay. max. Okay, so I'm just going to take like, a sequential models, uh, the multimodal learnings, the task applications involve using networks, input features from multiple domains uh, at once, right? Such as like you know, pathologist reports, gene expressions, cross domain whole site images to come up with a perhaps better, like, you no know, treatment response analysis or prognosis. Um, generative models are also good, like, you no know, uh, way of looking at, like, you no know, generating synthesized data uh, nowadays. Uh, is getting hyped by the diffusion generative models. Sorry, like I'm just kind of skimming through. Like, no multi instance learning is that you know, you know, you know, you know the definition. Like, uh, the bag of words, like the bag becomes the basically slide. Now the patches becomes the uh, you know the instances, and then the the way it's really done is that you embed the patches using an encoder, investigate most species patches in the slide, and then through using the attention mechanisms, and then aggregate for high level representation. Uh, contrastive learning also, which has been like you no know, seen like the, those a lot you know, many attentions are coming to our field as well, is that how can we actually leverage the self supervised, uh, you know, data to come up with a better representation learning models right through augmentation processes or like even sometimes using some level of weekly supervised representation which has been published in CDPR this year uh, to come up with a better to guide better the, uh, the contrast of learning framework. Um, so existing challenges, like the, at least, uh, you know, the one that I'm interested in is that, you know, we are, we need to step toward better representational learning model, which can generalize better, right? Um, so existing approaches is that you learn the encoder representation, either with the supervised learning or self-supervised. With the supervised, you have to target a specific organ in mind, and then you have limited annotated data, you will reach to perhaps the higher accuracy, but the downside is that it has a low generalization. Uh, and then with you actually digging with the, like if you do this with self-supervised or like in a weekly supervised learning, 
uh, you have access to broad ranges of, of organs and diseases. It ha you have abundance of weekly annotated full site images. It will, you will reach to better, like you no know, higher generalization, like you know, as well. Um, uh, the downside, probably, you know, it, the computational aspects that you require to process these uh, massive amount of data to come up with that representation learning. Uh, and then once you do that, then you need to downstream task for like, you know, whatever you have in mind, such as you know, diagnosis. Um, so steps towards like you know, better representation learning, like you no know, learning. These are the questions that like, I'd like, we would like to ask is that um, given the task application, uh, you know, we need to gather reasonable data, right? Mm -hmm. Is it in-house collection or we're outsourcing from existing data sets? So what are the policies for augmenting different annotation levels? Are we going to use different annotation levels or you want to basically stick with the, just the self-supervised form? Um, also, the, the, the next part is that we, we need to understand the realistic nature of these whole slide images as opposed to computer vision data, right? Uh, resolution or zooming matters in our field. Uh, and, and, and if you zoom in or zoom out, you will perceive different fields of views and that has a different meanings in pathology. Uh, curriculum training also is important like from easy to the hardness like, you know, of the data that you're going to pass for training. Uh, the tissue structures are also more uniform compared to natural images that also needs to be taken account. So these are kind of like a positive like you no know, directions. Um, and then you need to build your representational model. Architecture is one of the questions that we just asked and also the training algorithm. Uh, also needs to be also properly uh, thought through, like not just going like, you know, pick up your atom optimizer. It's better to invest some time into that to do your fine tuning, like you know, for hyperparameter tuning. Um, okay, so uh, how many minutes do I have? Like, you no, know, 12 minutes? About 10 minutes. Yeah. 10 minutes? Okay. So I'll, I'll take, uh, so I'm, I'm going toward the, re the research works from my lab now. Uh, so as you can see that the, uh, you know, the difference between the, com uh, you know, computer vision data versus the computational pathology data is that we have, you know, a lot of classes in computer vision, like ImageNet, for example, and also uh, a lot of diverse representations, but also when it comes to the classes, right, uh, for example, the truck, you would see that, you know, all of them are normal trucks, not accidental trucks, right? Uh, but when it comes to pathology, story is different. You have a limited number of classes. And it's an amalgamy of normal, healthy, and unhealthy data. So that's the, you know, the key difference. And if you move to another organ, it's the story gets repeated. Well, let's say from the breast, you need to like, you know, adopt the um, And uh, you know, when it comes to the feature representations, like you know, because of the mixed nature of these uh, you know, class, uh, the healthy and unhealthy, uh, you have a challenge to deal with. So, um, one one way of look the way that we uh we started to look at at the multimedia lab at U of T was that okay so it seems that there is better consensus uniformity on healthy representation and then when it moves to more diseased representation it becomes more complicated right um so the objective we had in mind is that is there any way that we can learn the healthy tissue representation to infer cancer without learning the cancer okay. So um, that's, in fact, actually, that's one of the steps of the curriculum training of the pathology, the residents. They first get trained with, like, you no, know, with the healthies. They need to know the tissue anatomy first. And then with years of experiences, they are thrown with more and more, you know, uh, hard, uh, hard cases or pathology cases to train. So that basically gave birth to the Atlas of Digital Pathology. What we did, like, you know, literally with few of undergrad students, we went in, like, you know, to the medicine department at the back in the 2017, 2018. We took the books, like the histology books, we brought it to our lab, we started to, you know, go through it. And we understood that, that there's a, basically, a, there's a taxonomy exists, like, there's a standard taxonomy is defined by the pathologist across, like, so, let's say, a particular organ. We, we approach this generally, but in a generic form. Uh, so, like, when you look into the high level representation, you have like, for example, epithelials, connective tissues, nervous, adipose, skeletal, and so on. And then every one of these, they actually might break down to more and more actually subfields, subclasses, right? So using like, you no, know, we revise this taxonomy to fit the machine learning purpose, and then we compile the data. And, uh, you know, uh, this was mainly on the histology. So it was a healthy data. 
to, rep to learn the representation. One way of looking at it, you can actually use it as a train, like as a training tool for the pathology residents is that, you know, if you want to identify different parts of the tissue, you can actually just go and like, you know, do a classification as a downstream task. So that's, that's really interesting because we had a, another speaker here just a couple of days ago, and the approach that they were using was that they would do clustering of all the patches, yes. uh, completely unsupervised manner, yes. and they would come up with a similar kind of yes. uh, um, distribution of the clusters. Yes. And then there would be you know, sets of clusters that would form one type of tissue, that's your high level of ontology, and you go deeper, yes. and you get you know those no ends yes. representation of different kinds. That's of the topics, second branch right? in my lab that we are trying to also accomplish. I'm going to cover that. But this was these were all manually labeled yes, eighteen and a half thousand patches, and they were labeled at all levels of ontology. Right? That's correct. So the, we are targeting like the project is ongoing with the uh, in collaboration with with few institutes. Uh, we are have we have designed we we have we have launched the uh, the server. We are engaging a few pathologists to uh, target. Right now, we are targeting the GI, uh, gastrointestinal, mm -hmm. and it's multi-label data, and it actually has the active learning component mm -hmm. to speed up the annotation. Uh, so, like soon, we will be releasing in the next coming year, like the bigger scale of this data set. And is it all publicly available? Uh, the at ADP, yes. The first version, yes. This one is. Uh, the next one is upcoming next year. Yes, hopefully, yeah, it's very promising, actually. So. Um, so I'm just going to uh, skim through. There were a lot of many utilities we developed with multi-label representation learning. We could supervise semantic segmentation to infer the patch level, uh, pixel level using the patch level class. Uh, you know, we transfer these labels to identify cancers on other target data sets. Specifically, when you look into the taxonomy, there are few actually labels, uh, diagnostically relevant labels that relate to the cancer. So, uh, and, and, and for example, the lymphocytes, for example, in colon, right? And then what we did, we did actually an interesting study back in the ECCV 2020 was that we trained a model using this ADP data. Not only we transferred the weights, but also we transferred the predicted labels to, to that data set. And we only concentrated on that diagnostically relevant labels. And what we observed was that the progression of the cancer in colon polyps was that statistically relevant to the progression, progression of the confidence score of the model. So, and so, it, it was, so what we just literally did, we adopted to colon polyps and we were able to identify the polyp areas. What's, is glass the, the gland segmentation yes. data set from yes. our group? Yes. <laughs> okay, so how, do you, how do you give it labels? Is it just, Low so, grade and high grade because yes. that's what we have in Yeah. So the first task is that whether this is cancerous, okay. not cancerous. Okay. And then also the next the come next coming phase is that there are four classes in the class. Okay. So you need to identify that, right? So you look into you we uh, take them to the bins and then like you know, uh, we see that you know progression of those uh, from lower grade to the high grade mm -hmm. is a statistic. So there's a rank order correlation. And lean there, L Y M. What does that stand for? Lymphocyte. We don't have lymphocyte annotation. Uh, no, uh, so that is the, uh, it's the lymphocyte. Is it the lymphocyte? Maybe, uh, maybe it's something else. Uh, what, what, what this study was showing that if you use the ADP for training, you also can use like another data set, which is an amalgam of healthy data in CRC, for example, or the cancer data sets which is statistically significant compared to our even data set, right? Uh, but uh, when we transferred those labels to the, the same data set for identifying cancer, we couldn't see that much of like no relevance, but in our case, there was actually good correlation. So that was the main study. And it was actually vetted by the pathologist for this colon polyp. So it, I think uh, this might be actually a uh, no, we don't have lymphocytes. No, no, no. It was just we were just segmenting glands, and, and then we just um, added. And these are relatively small images, oh, okay. quite small images. Uh, yes, the CRC. The CRC it's has lymphocytes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes.
That's CRC. close, but yeah. that's close. No, yeah, what, 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 what is they done is CRC is to yeah. SCN, SCN and people use this same data. So if they, they but, said, you train on the train on the limit side tiles from CRC, how does that transfer over to glass? Train on the normal tiles from CRC, how does that transfer over to glass? But you can only assess its performance on glass if you have those annotations for glass. So we refer we refer to the base backbone to train on those different cell types. What I'm showing you is when you train on normal tissue or much better downstream, then you train on a limit point aggregate tile. We treat the GLAS data, glass data, mm -hmm. as just the raw data to our the input to our model. And then we look into the prediction of the corresponding label that we train with the ADP or CRC. I'll, I'll look yeah. at the paper. Yeah. Really interesting. Okay. Uh, another new submission that we uh, you know, we have we, we come up with a better representation of learning for multi-labels, which is cross up you know, the cross between computer vision and pathology. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to like I'm interested to talk about this. Uh, so currently in my lab, we are actually concentrating on uh, auto-populating synoptic reports. Uh, we have a close tie with Shum Hospital at Montreal. That's the only uh, digital, fully digitized clinical pathology across Canada. Uh, so the, uh, the the idea is that is there any way that we can actually uh, create a pre-populated template for the pathologist to revise their you know, diagnostic report. And this is vitally important because according to like the, their stats, on certain cases, sometimes it takes more than half hour to fill up a synoptic report. Um, so there are a lot of advantages, as you can imagine. Um, what, what, uh, to approach this, there are, that's a big long shot. So in order to achieve that, uh, we're trying to develop a foundational representation learning model in our whole slide images. So uh, the way if you want to take a look at it is that, you know, the holistic nature of the slides has a story to tell, right? If you want to take a look at it self in a self-supervised, unsupervised form, like similar to like the book chapters, uh, which is nowadays is being used for training the LLMs, right? Uh, with mask training. So uh, you can actually take a look at the, you know, the slides and there are, a lot of like you know similar vocabularies, I would say, like you know, are there. And then the question is that how do you want to define them as a vocabulary, unique vocabulary, clustering them, as we were saying. And then uh, you know, going through zooming, like you know, zooming in all the way to zooming out, how do they ag aggregate on top of each other to tell the holistic story from this line level, right? Uh, there are actually uh, promising works in the field, some of them from your own lab as well. Uh, you know, the zooming, the aggregating, the uh, zooming in and zooming out. Uh, we can actually uh, take a look at the HIPT from Mahmoud Faisal's lab, uh, published in CVPR last year. Um, uh, and, and, and like, you know, uh, there are, when you're zooming in, you're looking at the more granular structure for diagnosis, right? Uh, there are detailed quantification of the tissue structures, perhaps you can take a look. Uh, but if you lose zooming out, then there's the high level interpretation of these tissue morphologies. And that's probably could be uh, you know, encoded by graph neural networks or vision transformers to uh, start to find these interrelationships. It's basically about the attention, right? Uh, so what are we trying to do is that now, uh, because of the lack of the severe lack of annotation compared to like you know, ImageNet, for example, nowadays, uh, we're trying to identify these unique tissue vocabularies similar to word embedding in NLP. So you have the, uh, you know, the tissue, like you have the, you know, the words, and then you get embedded, right, tokenize it, embed it, and then you go through mask training of these large language models. The question is that, can we also replicate the same story for whole slide images? So we're trying to basically address that. Um, and then you can downstream task, like you know, once you have a proper representation of the learning model, you can downstream task to uh, from image to text generation, right, to such as like, you know, the GPT, uh, to aggregate these visual cues and then like you know, fill in the, uh, the synoptic reports. I think that's the mainly it. To, uh, I'll just skip this through. So I think that's that, that was it. I uh, and also sorry, I know that what happened. Yeah. Well, obviously, like you no, know, uh, all these works that we have done and also through the survey, uh, etc. In the past. It comes with a very good collaboration uh, from several institutes. Uh, so I'm like you know, highly uh, honored to uh, basically work with a lot of different people so far. 
And currently I am, you know, I just got my position last year. So we just launched the Atlas Analytic website. So you can just go and take a look at that. Uh, you know, I built my team, hopefully like, you know, we'll do some meaningful works in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think in terms of time, probably should move on. But if you've got any burning questions, my very, very quick question. How long are you with us? Well, with, with, uh, yeah, yeah, today. today I'll, like, no, I know I will be available. Okay. Like, depends on your demand. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all with you now to me. Yeah, like I'm flexible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can chat. Sure, yeah. I'm going to stay smart. So we'll, we'll bring Martin back from lunch and then over to you. Nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> come by, come by later. Okay, sure. Now, like I told my assistant, today is not your day. Like this is the ATI day. So, <laughs> so, so sure. Right, so I've made the most of it, guys. Right. Thank you very much Thank and you. congratulations on your new position. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good stuff coming up. Okay, great. Um, Oh, all right. Almost lunch. Yeah, a bit of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone online. Yeah.